Okay. So good morning and sorry for that hectic beginning. Um, but uh, I think it was worth it and hopefully everybody will be able to see it. Otherwise I might have to do a rerun of the same, which might not be a bad idea because there's so much that you might like to see it twice. So today we're going to literally address Michelangelo's main um, career from the time of the Sistine Chapel to the end. Uh, just a little uh, information that I found uh, a few days ago is um, on at the Sotheby there will be an auction if you want to own a, a Sandro Botticelli. There is a painting by him, which is very rare, as you know, coming on the market, uh, the Christ on the cross. I think I showed it to you that you have it on the screen. Um, and it's going for sale with an estimate between 800,000 and a million two pounds on the 10th of December. That's the evening sale at Sussby London. So if you feel like it, just go on the net and give them your credentials. Um, but anyway, this is a, an interesting, there are some gorgeous things on that sale, by the way. So let's go on and uh, let's look again at a timeline. So I have put on here, it's the, the four painters that um, were part of the group sent by uh, Lorenzo de' Medici to uh, Rome to paint and uh, decorate the lower part of the Sistine Chapel. So you have an idea how uh, contemporary they are to Michelangelo. As you can see Michelangelo is quite a bit younger. I also added Bramante. Bramante is the architect uh, that um, was more or less contemporary with Michelangelo and with whom he's going to have a lot of trouble. Bramante was very jealous of Michelangelo and uh, really uh, had that kind of um, feud with him, not really in words, but he was really uh, playing a bad role uh, next to the Pope against Michelangelo. And then I've added Raphael, who we will see in January. And Raphael, he's also a rival of Michelangelo. Though he admired what he was doing, they were completely opposite in personality. But you can see that Raphael had a very short life. He died at 37. And so compared to almost 89 for Michelangelo, which is an unusual long life at that period of time, particularly with the work that he, he did. Uh, I put a new line here, the 1527, which is the time of the sack of Rome, to give you an idea who was who uh, at that time, uh, the sack of Rome, which is going to really um, mark Michelangelo uh, he won't believe uh, what the, the terrible uh, disaster is going to be for Rome. And then down below, you have the line for the Medici uh, family. Uh, at that time, there's a series, they come back in 1512 after an exile in starting in 94. And then you have a series of short uh, period with lesser known people. Then you have Alessandro who's going to um, be at the head more or less of the, the council in Florence between 31 37 will be assassinated in 37 and then comes the long period of Cosimo the Great and we'll talk more about that. The popes that are going to play a role for Michelangelo start literally uh, he is never going to meet Alexander VI, but starts with Julius II, and he's going to run all the way to Paul IV. So let's look at Michelangelo. For those of you that were not there last time, he was born close to, to Florence in Caprese in 1475, was apprenticed to Ghirlandaio for about three years, uh, was introduced to the circle of Lorenzo de' Medici, literally lived in the household of Lorenzo de' Medici for some years. 1494, he is going to flee Florence to Bologna uh, by the way of uh, Venice. Uh, and this is going to mark him for many reasons. By 96, he goes back to Rome and in Rome is going to 
though he was an unknown uh, sculptor at that time, he is going to uh, receive the commission for the Pieta, the first Pieta, which is going to put him on the map, though less than he thought. When he goes back to Florence, he thought he was going to be lauded as the new young sculptor, not at all, they haven't even heard of the Pieta. But anyway, he wins the privilege of uh, sculpting that stone, that big marble slab that was in Florence. Um, and he's going to um, sculpt the famous David. This is for this time going to put him on the map. He is going to be called then to Rome uh, in 1505. The Pope, and this is where we left it, is going to ask Julius II, who is by then the Pope, uh, is going to ask him to design his tomb. And this was very usual where the uh, important people would plan their tomb before they died. And uh, this design was absolutely enormous. And literally for uh, Michelangelo, that was supposed to be the highlight of his career. As we'll see, this was unfortunately a disaster. Um, we'll go through uh, the whole story. In 1506, because the Pope is not happy with him, Michelangelo again flees Rome, goes to Florence. And then from Florence, he's sent by force to Bologna to meet the Pope who is over there. He's going to go there, has to apologize for leaving Rome. And the Pope is going to give him some commissions including a project in the Sistine Chapel, which is the famous ceiling, uh, which he will work on from 1508 to 1512. Then he goes back to Florence in 1513 to 16, when he's going to work for the Medicis. Uh, will be asked to do the Medici Chapel in San Lorenzo. And this is mostly because the new Pope, who is a Medici, wants to make sure that his family gets properly treated uh, in uh, Florence. During the 1527 to 29, we know 27 is the sack of Rome, but there's also a war against the Medici and therefore being so closely linked to the family, he flees to Venice. The 27, we know that we have the sack of Rome and then he's going to go into hiding until he's pardoned by Clement VII in 1530. He will go to, uh, back to Rome for good now uh, in 1534 and will be asked by the new Pope to uh, finish the decoration of the Sistine Chapel with the famous Last Judgment, which is going to run from 36 to 41. And then in 46, he will be chief architect to St. Peter and a lot of other things will happen there we'll talk and he will die in Rome on February 18th 1564. The popes during uh, his lifetime at least his the height of his career Julius II known is a de la Rovere in family will reign from 1503 to 13. He's the famous warrior pope known together with Michelangelo, both of them were known for their terribilita, their very strong character and, and uh, short fuse type of character. He's known to have organized the Swiss Guard and expelled France from Milan and Florence and considered the liber liberator of Italy. Uh, in 13, with a very short uh, no, sorry, in 13, Leo X is going to uh, succeed to him. He's a Medici and he's going to really uh, start working hard on St. Peter Basilica that had been started by Julius, by the way. He's going to reorganize the Roman University. He's, by the way, the last Pope not to have been in priestly orders at the time of his election to the papacy. Cardinals were not, uh, the, the, didn't have to be priests to have uh, gone through the orders to become cardinal. But this is the last pope that wasn't. Adrian the Sixth Boyens, he's the Dutch uh, uh, pope that refused to compromise with Lutheranism. Uh, he also demanded Luther's condemnation as a heretic, and then also was threatened by the advances of the Ottoman Turks. As you see, his reign was very short, uh, just over a year. 
And he was succeeded then by another Medici, Clement VII, who was faced with Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation, struggle in Italy between the Holy Roman Emperor and Francis I of France. He also saw Turkish invasion of Eastern Europe led by Suleiman the Magnificent, and then uh, was instrumental in the breaking away with King Henry VIII uh, from the Catholic Church. He was the one who was in Rome at the time of the sack. And by the way, approved in 1533, Nicolaus Copernicus theory that the earth revolves around the sun, which uh, was um, as far as even religion, a very important step. The next Pope, Paul III, is a Farnese, initiated the Counter-Reformation with the Council of Trent to try to go against the Reformation, try to define, redefine the church. And this will be done in many meetings that are going to overlap the other Popes. Uh, he is going to witness the wars of religion with Emperor Charles V against the Protestant in Germany. And he will recognize new religious orders such as the Jesuit, the Barnabites, and the Congregation of the Oratory. Um, Jules III uh, didn't have a lot. He's a Del Monte, part of the family of Del Monte. Uh, he's known to have been the patron of the composer uh, Palestrina. Paul IV, coming from the Cahafa family, compelled, and that's an interesting point too, compelled the Jews of Rome to wear distinctive clothing and confine themselves to a ghetto. He also cut off Michelangelo's pension and he ordered the nudes of the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel to be painted more modestly. We'll go through that too. Finally, Pius IV, who is also a Medici, will preside over the last session of the Council of Trent. And during the, his reign, Michelangelo rebuilt the Basilica of Santa Maria degli Angeli. Um, all these popes, it, the fact that they succeed one another have, with um, one another, sometimes with just one year or two years, uh, makes it an unstable regime, if you want. Don't forget, they were the head of the Papal States that was a pretty large state in the center of Italy. The absolute power of, of course gives them that kind of secure legitimacy and they really like tradition because they look back and want to make sure that they show how legitimate they are. However, they're going to attract new artists and that's going to cause some innovations. Julius II, sorry. Um, was a, an antique collector, including the Apollo Belvedere that you see there on the right. He established the Vatican Museum. He was a reformer. He liked new visual language. For that, Michelangelo was a perfect um, instrument, if you want. Uh, his office follows the imperial model. His architect was Donato Bramante. Uh, he will add the Belvedere courtyard, as we will see, to the Vatican. And he initiated the rebuilding of the St. Peter's Basilica. As I mentioned, the old St. Peter was too small and in really bad shape because it had been neglected during the time the popes were in Avignon. The tomb, he's uh, going to commission a huge, huge tomb, which finally when it's realized is about a tenth of what it was originally. And of course the Sistine ceiling and the Stanza della Segnatura by Raphael, and as well as the Stanza Deliodoro. Here is, uh, just to give you an idea, here we see the Belvedere courtyard with the Vatican Palace. And so he's going to commission the whole design of that beautiful garden that is, uh, uh, facing the, the uh, Belvedere, uh, part of the apartments of the, the Pope. As you can see here is the new St. Peter, the way it is with the Bernini colonnade that's gonna come next century. And then we have all these uh, gardens with the, uh, the Belvedere here, which is that kind of more leisurely uh, residence for the Pope. Uh, we have the Sistine Chapel 
etc., etc. This is the plan of the Vatican. When Michelangelo uh, comes back to, to Rome, uh, he is going to live, as you see, this is an old pictures in around 1900 that shows the way St. Peter, we are right now on the roof of the Basilica and we facing towards Rome. Uh, the castle, Castello San Angelo is there and the river Tiber is uh, running through here. But this, as you know, that avenue had not been pierced yet. And so it was full of, of uh, houses. And Michelangelo's um, workshop, as well as the place where he lived, uh, was around uh, this area. So he was very close to St. Peter. Uh, and you can imagine when he started working on the tomb, which was supposed to go in the new St. Peter, he had all the marble, by the way, in this area. So uh, in 1505, uh, Michelangelo was summoned to Rome by Julius II, who uh, commissioned him a huge tomb uh, that was destined to stand in the new St. Peter. Don't forget the old St. Peter is not even down yet, but he's already planning. And so he wants uh, sketches by Michelangelo uh, to give an idea. And this is what we believe the original sketch would have looked like. Uh, it shows you a three-story um, tomb that was actually um, standalone. It would probably, according to Julius, would have stood just behind the altar in the center of the new St. Peter. The design shows Julius II at the very top, some angels supporting his catafalque, uh, two statues, a huge statues. These are all more than life-size uh, statues of um, Moses and Paul. Excuse me, two seconds, and victories. Okay. Okay, come. Stop. Um, so Paul and Tucker, come here. Tucker, come here. Uh, and then uh, Moses on the right. And Moses is the only one that uh, we know. We'll see that at the end. At the bottom, we have a whole uh, sense of uh, allegories. The lower level is literally dedicated to men where we have prophets and saints at the middle level. Here we have two victories that are surrounded by prisoners. And this is very much an, an allegory showing the arts that are dying with the death of Julius II. He considered that there would be no future um, after his death for any of the arts. Of all these statues that were supposed to be over 40 originally, only six remained. Uh, though some were already done and uh, ended up in other parts of, the, of Europe. So there is Michelangelo. He's, of course, he makes the drawing. He has to go to Carrare to order the, the uh, marble. He orders all that marble, the marble comes in, and then he can't get the money from, from the Pope. He goes to the Pope, to the Vatican, because the Pope had said he wanted to talk to him. And he goes five times, and every time he's refused entrance. And literally, he's almost thrown out the last time. So he feels that something is wrong. He hears rumors that uh, Bramante, is uh, kind of plotting against him and that the Pope has changed his mind and doesn't want to do the tomb now, uh, but he's going to do other things. And so literally Michelangelo gets so scared that he's going to leave in a hurry. Uh, he tells his um, workers in the studio to sell all his tools to Jewish people that were not far and he goes uh, back to Florence. He is in Florence for about a year. And the, as we know, the Medici's are not in Florence at that time, but Soderini, who is the Golfaniere, um, 
Golfan, uh, Golfan Nieri. Uh, in, so the, the, the head of the council in uh, Florence receives letters from the Pope that says, I want Michelangelo to come back. And Michelangelo refused. He, he feels his uh, life is threatened. And finally, he has to get a letter from the Pope telling him that he will be safe and unharmed if he goes and meets him. But by that time, um, the, the Pope has gone, uh, as he was a warrior Pope, he took his army and uh, went up to recover some territories that he had lost. And he's by that time in Bologna. And so he goes, uh, he calls Michelangelo to Bologna and literally Michelangelo has to go there, as he says, the rope around the neck to go and be pardoned by Julius. Uh, Julius uh, accepts him, he's okay. He is uh, there and he is asking, instead of going on with the tomb, he tells uh, Michelangelo to make a huge statue that is supposed to be uh, set on the facade of one of the main churches in Bologna, but he wants a statue made of bronze. And Michelangelo is not a bronze sculptor. He is a carver. Big difference uh, in the techniques, of course. Uh, marble carving or even wood carving would be what you call a negative sculpture. You remove things from the material, whereas the bronze is an additive uh, sculpting because you start with wax and you make a whole uh, modello uh, for the the sculpture and for the sculpture and then of course uh, you have to go through the whole process of uh, bronze so very different Michelangelo is not used to that at all he's seen it maybe a couple of times he has to find some uh, people that are very uh, comfortable with that medium. He finds a few in Milan and in Bologna. He gets them. It's a very difficult time. He writes to his brother that he has rented a room with only one bed and four of them have to sleep in that one bed. And so not very comfortable either, especially that he has some problems with two of his assistants. So finally, after a lot of problems, that statue is made huge statues, four times the, the, the life size, so the huge, huge thing. They put it on and the statue will be removed uh, about three years later when Bologna is taken again by uh, its previous family and it will be melted happily by the population who didn't care for uh, Julius III. And uh, it will be melted and turned into a canon that they're going to name Julia for the Pope. So this is an interesting sideline. At that time, Michelangelo and the Pope go back to Rome and the Pope decides, forget about the tomb for the moment. The church is not built yet, so we have no place to put it in. So let's concentrate on the Sistine Chapel. And there we are. This is the view, the actual view of the Sistine Chapel from uh, the outside, as you can see, built uh, with big buttresses to, to make sure that the walls don't collapse. This was probably built by Baccio Pontelli at the end of the 15th century. And it would have looked more like this because all the buildings around didn't exist at that time. So uh, you have windows at the level of the just above the frescoes that were made uh, in the, at the end of the 15th century. And then you have, um, as you can see, a small roof that is actually shown inside as a barrel vault. Here is an uh, engraving showing the uh, Chapel Sistine after uh, these frescoes here were done by Ghirlandaio, Signorelli, Perugino, etc. And what they want is Michelangelo to paint, not especially the whole ceiling, but definitely uh, the pendentives and uh, some of these there where the Pope decides he wants to have um, some paintings of the apostles. The ceiling itself is painted blue with golden stars. 
uh, Michelangelo is going to discuss uh, the whole uh, program and says, you know, everybody does the apostles. We have to do something more significant. The, by the way, the ceiling had been damaged. A big crack had appeared in the very middle, and that's why they had to redo it anyhow. So here is the view of uh, the, the Sistine Chapel nowadays. You see again these fresco that we discussed last uh, two, two times ago the images of the popes that haven't been removed. And then this is the way the um, ceiling shows. Uh, it's, a, it's a very slight uh, barrel vault. The contract was written in 1508 for, as I mentioned, 12 apostles in what we call the spandrels. And the spandrels are these um, part of the architecture which um, makes that unifies, if you want, the ceiling with the walls, where these triangles have to go in more in recess to accommodate the windows. This is just to remind you of the way the walls looked. So with the different, and on one side, we have uh, the life of Moses, and on the other, we have the life of Christ that we're corresponding, if you want. Uh, Moses being that uh, very important figure in the Old Testament that justifies the arrival of, um, of Christ and, and mirrors, in a sense, in many ways, uh, his life. This is one of the paintings by Luca Signorelli. Uh, who is one painter who is going to influence uh, Michelangelo, particularly this type of figures that he was uh, showing like this, that doesn't have really a place in the painting that we can explain, but Signorelli was very interested in the anatomy. And this is the kind of figure that the young Michelangelo would have been interested in. Just for those of you that are not as familiar with it, what is fresco buono? Again, don't forget that Michelangelo is primarily a sculptor. He's He's done, when he was at uh, Gerlandaio, he's done uh, painting, but um, the, for him, as he was telling the Pope, you know, I'm a sculptor. And the Pope said, you can paint, you will do it. And in fact, they, many people believe that Bramante uh, literally kind of whistled that in the ear of the Pope to try to take down Michelangelo, um, that he would fail at that challenge. Uh, so here's a quick uh, reminder on how the fresco buono works, is the wall is covered uh, with a pretty thick layer of arricio, which is the plaster, but it's a coarse type of plaster. So uh, you, they establish at that time the vertical and horizontal lines, and then they go for preparation drawings. How are they going to transfer these uh, drawings? Of course, you have first the project, which is gonna be on a small scale, and then they will bring it to, uh, to scale and are going to um, reproduce it on the site, either by a grid system that came rather later, or brush drawing, which is called a synopia. So where they literally give already uh, the contours and uh, some of the, the shadows, the mo most important shadows. Uh, or they can do it with the cartoon and we'll see a demonstration of that in some uh, dark powder. This is, this is called the spulvero, uh, where they will perforate the cartoon and then with a little pouch are going to go around and get some of that dark powder and then they can um, connect the dots literally and have the uh, contours made. Then once that is done, they're going to apply a smooth layer of plaster on the Corsa Riccio. Uh, it's called the intonaco, only on the small part of the wall because the plaster has to be wet when you apply the pigment, it can only be set 
for what you're going to do in one day. And this is why in Italian it's called the giornata. Uh, and so it's that rectangle or square, or whatever, that they decide, okay, I'm going to do that today. They apply the intonaco on the wall. And this is where the artist is going to work on that very day. They apply the pigment on the west plaster. It dries lighter than the original color. And then sometimes once it's over, as some colors react to the chemical process when the, the pigment hits the wet plaster, some of the colors have to be applied on drywall, such often the um, gold, definitely, and the uh, blue, the, the very uh, beautiful blue made with uh, lapis lazuli that is called fresco seco. So here we can imagine uh, the whole thing with the scaffolding. And you can see here that they put some sinopia already. So they have some drawings already done before they add the intonaco. Here is the arricio plus the intonaco. So the gray thing is the intonaco. It's going to dry clear. And here they are uh, painting on one giornata. So this is considered at the part that the painter can do in one day. So let's imagine the, the whole ceiling in the Sistine Chapel probably is made of over 300 uh, giornata, if not more. And then this is the way they paint it. Here is a little demonstration on how the spolvero works. Lo spolvero è una delle tecniche più antiche per riportare senza variazioni di scala un disegno eseguito su carta su nuovo supporto. Sorry Il for disegno the veniva fittamente bucherellato lungo ogni singolo contorno con una cugella, ovvero una stecciola metallica dalla punta simile a quella di un ago. Poggiato il foglio così bucherellato sul nuovo supporto, si provvedeva a battere in corrispondenza dei fori con un sacchetto so di tela the holes, larga, the powder is come out. di carbone, in modo che la posizione di un singolo foro contour. venisse impressa sul supporto. Il disegno poteva poi facilmente essere ripassato e rafforzato con and inchiostro so stesso a Le tracce really lasciate dalla polvere venivano quindi eliminate, spolverando la superficie con un mazzo di piume. Okay, so this is an idea. So now let's look at that ceiling, which is much more than just the creation of Adam or the creation of man. As you can see, there's a multitude of uh, paintings of all kind, and we're going to try to make sense of that. So this is the side of the altar, and this is the side of the entrance. And Michelangelo, uh, once he starts the Sistine Chapel, will start from that side. Uh, and we see from here, so this is the ceiling. These are what you call the pendentive. Um, but he's going to still, and we see literally in the five years that the Sistine Chapel, or the four years that the Sistine Chapel will take uh, to, will, will be uh, painted, we see a real evolution from that part to that part where his style is liberated and becomes much more dynamic and strong. So let's look at the names because we're going to come back to them. We have pendentives, and these are these four triangles that literally uh, make architectural sense of that barrel ceiling to the walls uh, on the side. So it's that link between the ceiling and the and the walls uh, at the at the corners. Then we have the spandrels, and these are the the bottom parts that are between the windows and that come down uh, between these triangles uh, that them are going into recess towards the windows. And then we have the lunettes and we can barely see them, but you see the, the top of the window here and there and the lunettes are what is around literally the windows. And they each have a different iconography. A quick timeline of the Sistine Chapel. In 1504, a diagonal crack in the vault had made the chapel unusable. 
So <clears throat> the Pope commissioned uh, Michelangelo to do uh, the, the decoration and will receive between uh, 1505 and 1506 uh, the, the preliminary drawings. And of course, this is according to the first ID to have the spandrels painted with the apostles. In 1506, as we said, uh, Michelangelo goes the rope around the neck to Bologna and meets the Pope, makes the bronze statue of Julius II, which is, as I told you before, melted in 1509, becomes the canon La Giulia. The first idea was to paint spandrels with a pause, and Michelangelo quickly convinces the Pope that this is really not a, an exciting program, and so that he wants to do a much more important scheme. So discussion, again, we have to understand that the Pope might take some decision, but all the details is gonna go through some theologian and God, there are plenty around in the, um, in the Vatican. And only then the theologian is going to discuss with the artist uh, what the whole program is. Then the artist himself has some freedom in the representation of uh, the, of uh, the, you know, the, the different figures. So the main, um, the central part, so the top of the, the ceiling is going to uh, recount the Genesis, literally the biblical history before the coming of Christ. Um, and we have three parts, each of them with three different uh, medaillons, uh, the creation, Adam and Eve and Noah. Now, don't believe that from the time they signed the contract that things they can start painting. No. First of all, Michelangelo has to find assistant. Again, he's not familiar with the fresco uh, medium. And so he has to find people that are much more familiar with them. And his idea, apparently, at the beginning was that he would make the project, all the drawings, and then his assistants would paint which is not what's going to happen. So prior to April uh, 1508, he goes to Florence and hires uh, a whole series of assistants, most of them coming from the workshop of Ghirlandaio, who was quite a fresco painter. He did a lot of works, as I have shown you, in different uh, chapels in um, Florence. Then the second problem is scaffolding. This is very high. So what uh, kind of scaffolding are they going to use? Bramante proposes a scaffold that would be suspended in the air with ropes, but would be anchored in the ceiling. And very quickly, Michelangelo demonstrates, okay, so when we take the scaffolding down, who is going to go and fill in the holes in which the scaffolding, from which the scaffolding is hanging? So the Pope decides, okay, Michelangelo, you build your own scaffold. And so he designs a flat wooden uh, platform on brackets that is built up from holes in the wall, just high up near the top of the windows. So contrary to popular belief, he never lied on the scaffolding, but he painted from standing position. So much so that when he finished the uh, Sistine Chapel, uh, for about a year, he was incapable of reading a text in front of him. He had to put it higher because his neck was so uh, blocked in that position. So it took him about a year to recover from that ordeal. Many of the names uh, that you see here are the assistant, Francesco Granacci, who was a good friend of Michelangelo, will be the head of the assistants, the kind of the, the headmaster. And uh, we have a succession of um, assistants here, are a few names. Uh, some of them are not going to stay. Um, and finally, he's going to reduce it to its minimum. And finally, he is going to be the one who paints and the others are going to probably uh, help with the whole idea. Uh, the one would put the intonaco and um, Another one would probably apply the designs and so on, but it's Michelangelo who painted, not his uh, assistant. 
But again, before they could do all that, and so before May 1508, a friend of Michelangelo uh, will have to plaster the entire ceiling uh, with the arricho, because as I said, there was a big crack and they have to cover, of course, the uh, ceiling with the painted in blue. So that has to be set and then had to dry. And now we have to also understand that during that whole time, the Sistine Chapel is functioning, which means they cannot make too much noise when there is a mass. They have to be very careful not to drop plaster or, or pigments on the floor on the, the head of the cardinals there. So it's, it's a really difficult ordeal. They started painting probably around September 1508 and the, the Sistine Chapel will be made in three campaigns. Why? Because the first one, after a couple of months into the process, some mold is going to develop in the, the ceiling. And so they have to stop and find a cure for that mold before they can start again. Then from fall 15, uh, they will paint all the way to fall 1510, which brings them about halfway in the ceiling. They have to stop for almost a year by lack of funds. And then start again, it's summer 1511 to October 12. Uh, and uh, what happened, there will be some modification in the uh, topology of the ceiling, uh, sorry, not the, 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 in the iconography, there will be some changes. But also remember, they have to deal with winter. In the winter, the, the uh, plasters is not dry as well. Uh, it's difficult for their hands if it's really cold to work. So they have to deal with the weather too. The ceiling is also not a flat ceiling or just a barrel vault. There are lots of places that are recessing or whatever. And they have to keep in mind that the figures need to appear to project forward. Um, and also wait once it's dry to add the lapis lazuli, uh, that beautiful blue and the gold. Now, once it's done, it will be inaugurated in 1513, uh, but the Sistine Chapel will have some damage, which is going to lead to the great restoration uh, at the end of the last century. The uh, great damages will be caused by an explosion of the powder magazine at Castel San Angelo. And you've seen that is quite a way away, but it still will damage the Sistine Chapel in 1797. And then we have the restoration that we will talk about later. So hopefully that gives you a, a better understanding of the whole process. So let's look at uh, the first panel that shows the drunkenness of Noah. So we're going backward as far as the uh, sequence is concerned. This should be the last one, but this is the first one that Michelangelo has painted. And that's why I'm showing it uh, to you that way, because we will see the style evolving from there. Uh, there is an alternation on the, the ceiling. You have the smaller panel that are surrounded uh, by a fake cornice a marble cornice that is actually a temple, so it's painting, it's, it's really flat. And we have these smaller uh, paintings, this one showing the drunkenness of Noah. The four figures that you see around there actually are at the feet of the prophets and the sibyls that are on either side, but they also surround these uh, paintings. Uh, these are called the Ignudi, we will see them later. One thing I want to stress is that they hold these nets full of acorns and um, oak leaves, which was part of the coat of arms of the De La Rovere family, so of Julius II. So his signature is uh, everywhere. So this uh, scene shows Noah who is asleep, drunk, and his children come and two out of the three children are mocking the father because he's falling asleep uh, because he had too much to drink. Whereas the third one that you see standing in the middle is going to cover to make him uh, 
uh, more modest. And this is considered a prefiguration of the mocking of Christ. As you can see, this is part of the damage that the Sistine Chapel had at the time of the explosion. Uh, an interesting point, too, is the evidence of the uh, genitals of uh, Noah. And this is not an accident, but in fact, Noah is considered the repopulator of the earth. As Adam, we will see, is considered the populator, but uh, Noah, after the, the flood, is considered the repopulator of the flood. And therefore, uh, the genitals are very sh shown very much in uh, evidence. This is quite inspired by the uh, Lorenzo Tiberti uh, from the East Door, the pa Doors of Paradise uh, in Florence. And of course, as I mentioned before, Michelangelo is looking at all this and he gets his inspiration in Bologna or in Florence. And this shown, you can see the figure here of uh, Noah uh, laying down with uh, the uh, sons around him. The second scene shows the deluge. And as you can see, that one is very large. It is not framed all around like this one. It's about four times the size of the previous one. And we have that alternation of smaller and larger uh, images. So we see uh, in this, uh, this case, Uh, the deluge that was considered at that time as a prefiguration of baptism, whereas this, uh, the ark is uh, literally the symbol of uh, the, the church itself. And we have two different kinds of crowds. We have the people uh, that believed Noah and followed him, and then you have the bad people, and the bad people are going to, of course, drown into the flood. Again, a smaller scene shows the sacrifice of Noah, though there is some uh, contention on, the, on that scene that uh, it could be uh, Cain and Abel, uh, but it would break the cycle of three images for So sacrifice um, that is supposed to, to uh, follow the deluge should follow and not proceed. But this might have been for uh, the sake of, um, of just the format having to alternate the smaller and the bigger. We still see the ignudi on the round, very dynamic composition. And in these medallions, by the way, that they uh, hold are different stories also of the Old Testament. In this case, the destruction of the statue of the god Baal and the killing of Uriah. Close to the center is now the first scene with uh, Adam and Eve. This is, of course, the third episode. This is uh, the, the fall when um, Eve takes the apple from the serpent. And um, uh, of course the expulsion, this is in the same, it's a continuous narrative, and the expulsion from the Garden of Eden by the angel. The coloring is getting really more uh, subtle. When you see here, for example, the, the color of the, the snake, it is almost iridescent in the way that he said that greenish color on the places that are closer to us. Uh, the tree itself is a fig tree, so he's probably giving her a fig and not an apple. And of course, these figs become the symbol of modesty where once they are uh, ejected from the Garden of Eden, they will cover their genitals with a fig leaf. As you can see, the, this, um, 
landscape is shown in a very abstract way. You see very much difference between the Garden of Eden where we have just the tree and we have some rocks, uh, but not much of a luxurious landscape that you can imagine for the Garden of Eden. And this is pretty desertic on the other side. And of course, yeah, the tree of knowledge in this case is the fig tree. He was definitely influenced by uh, something he'd seen in Bologna on the famous door uh, of the St. Petronius in Bologna, uh, the beautiful framing by Jacopo della Quercia of Adam and Eve being chased from um, the Garden of Eden. And we can see the inspiration that he got from that place. Creation of Eve is one of the small panels. As you can see, Adam is uh, laying down asleep. Uh, and of course, this is, we have to think again that Adam has already been created. So the creation of the woman follows. Um, surrounded again by the beautiful Ignudi and holding this medallion with scarves. And a very strong presence of God the Father. And here is uh, one of these medallion that uh, gives you uh, an idea of uh, the representation it's either David before the prophet, Nathan, or Alexander before the high priest of Jerusalem. Sometimes uh, we're not quite sure of the symbolism. Of course, the central figure is the creation of Adam and this absolutely forceful figure. This is one of the most complex composition uh, in Western art and very sublime. It has been praised by absolutely everybody uh, you have an, a new vision of humanity. Adam is on uh, a green brown mount, uh, which is, represents the earth with very, again, very little uh, landscape detail. And we have to keep in mind, this is seen from quite far away. So small details wouldn't work. Uh, now, there's a great contrast between the, the, the energy of God the Father and Adam, who seems to be almost lifeless until he touches the finger of God. Just the same as with um, Noah, as we can see, the, the genitals are quite in evidence. And this is the, the whole idea of um, the future procreation of humankind. He is supposed to be the perfect man. He is the fallen man. Uh, but at that time, he's still the perfect man. A lot of uh, representation, a lot of uh, interpretation of uh, this representation showed the idea that Adam goes back into the Kabbalistic interpretation of the, the Bible. He is the Adam Katman. Uh, that is issued from the hand of God and who remains more of an idea than a reality until uh, he uh, becomes a real figure as Adam. And many people are trying to understand the figure of God and the figures that surround him. Taken in the arm of God is a female figure that uh, they assume is the not yet created Eve. And then we have also the kind of oval, oval uh, envelope, if you want, from which um, God comes out and it seems to be almost like an egg, the cosmic egg. But an absolutely incredible work. 
And you can see again, he's looking around. This is the uh, Belvedere torso, which had, was part of the collection of Julius II. And there is definitely an inspiration of that, that musculature uh, that comes back from that uh, classical sculpture. Going backward again, we now have the creation of the world. And this is the third event of the creation of the world, the separation of the earth from the water, uh, where we have that, again, that absolutely dynamic figure in, in full uh, foreshortening of Christ coming out of that, that big drapery that surrounds him, uh, supported by some putties that comes and is going to separate the sky from the the the, the air is from the water. An ex extraordinary a representation of God looking down with the, the very beautiful, very muscular, strong hands. Now, one of the most enigmatic uh, figure is the creation of the sun, moon, and plants. So we have on the right the figure of Christ, of a God uh, with the hands, one on the moon, the other one on the sun, uh, with the uh, furrowed um, eyebrows. The, the really the the lot of concentration in that beautiful figure, and then the enigmatic scene on the the left of a cry of a god leaving the scene showing the back of his feet and literally the uh, his lower back in full vision which is quite interesting and where he creates um, the plants and there'll be a lot of discussion or a lot of avoidance of discussion on that image a lot of people don't want to talk about the lower of the back of god um, but uh, Apparently, all this goes back again to the scriptures where um, God tells Moses to remove his sandals when he's on holy ground. Uh, and in because this is the thing that is the closest to the earth and therefore uh, shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't have anything else but him uh, being shown. And so in this case, they believe that what God is saying uh, to, um, to Moses, he continues, he says, see, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a, depth, a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I will take away my hand and you will see my back but my face shall not be seen. And they assume that this is uh, what um, the theologian as well as Michelangelo relied on uh, to show that quite interesting view of God. And finally, what is the uh, first of all the images is the separation of light from darkness uh, with God in the center, who is again, a very foreshortened view. Imagine again, you see that from down below, we separating the light from the, um, from the darkness. So I think you have been able to appreciate the difference uh, that there is between the first rather classical rendering of Noah to what is completely new in painting at that time is the vision of Michelangelo uh, on uh, God and from the time of the creation on, uh, the energy that he really puts into his uh, figures. Now, within uh, what we call the spandrels, he's put uh, the on one side and on both ends the prophets, prophets. Uh, who in the Old Testament are going to prophesy the arrival of the Savior, of the Messiah. And so these different figures are um, uh, 
centered in each of the spandrels. The first one being Zechariah, that also at the bottom shows the coat of arms of the De La Rovere family. And these figures also are extremely interesting in the incredible volume and energy that they show in the torsion, which is so typical of Michelangelo and is pretty new in the world of art. So Zachariah normally is always represented as a young man. And in this case, he shows him with a beard and, and the rare hair on his head. He's the one who um, prophesies apparently the coming of a king riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. That is Palm Sunday, of course, and the descent of the Holy Ghost in, in, in Pentecost. The next one is Joel. He has that um, ash blue tunic with pink reflection, beautiful highlights again, a very dynamic position, though he's supposed to sit down, but you have the feeling he's gonna jump out of his seat. Isaiah, uh, very different in character. He seems to be listening very intently. He's more at peace. It looks it's the little puto next to him, what they call the genies uh, that are around them, that it seems to be much more agitated. He's clad with the green cloak of hope. And he's quite often, as we know, uh, mentioned by, uh, in, even in the New Testament, uh, John and others that always uh, mention Isaiah that, uh, saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him in his prophecies. Ezekiel, the prophet of the Merkaba, he's the divine throne and chariot of fire, the heavenly hierarchy and the four cherubim is shown, uh, they're comforted by his vision. And uh, we have again the torsion of the body, he's holding a scroll in the left hand. And you can see the, the force with which he turns has the, the whole scarf flying behind him. Extraordinary profile. He's shown very much as an Israelite. And then the very beautiful, almost kind of a 3D Botticelli, the face of the genie. And Daniel, Daniel, of course, is not considered as a prophet, uh, but because of his courage and his sturdiness, he's really revered and uh, considered also an ancestor of Christ. Sorry, it goes too fast. Uh, and Jeremiah, <laughs> who is painted a little later, so you can also see an evolution in the way uh, they are painted. Uh, he is, in a sense, almost a representation of Michelangelo because he's a very melancholic uh, figure and, in a sense, a, a moral self-portrait of Michelangelo, who was a very Saturnian character, very short fuse or very melancholic. Again, that incredible force. It, it, I was thinking about Michelangelo last night and thinking it, just the vision he has of, of the uh, energy, that, that potential of energy in a human being is, is incredible. Look at the, the size of that wrist and the, the size of the hands is amazing. And then finally talk about an incredible foreshortening and energy is Jonah. Uh, symbol of course of the resurrected Christ. Uh, he, his image is above the altar. 
So the, the idea of the resurrection that he was eaten, taken, at least uh, swallowed by, by the whale and then rejected three days later is of course a direct symbolism with the resurrection Christ that dies and three days later is resurrected. And here there is definitely an inspiration uh, that comes from the Laocon that had been discovered uh, about six years prior uh, to Michelangelo painting, but Michelangelo had seen De Vizu. He was there when they uh, brought it out and must have been absolutely amazed by uh, the, the energy of that uh, Hellenistic sculpture. I've had many questions about the Sibyls because the, uh, there are five Sibyls that um, face the prophets. And why the Sibyls? These are um, pagan figures. But to try to reconcile the uh, antique literature, the, the classical literature with uh, Christianity, a lot of um, scholars worked really hard in trying to interpret some of the saying that were attributed to the, the Sibyls with the arrival of Christ and the arrival of the Messiah. And so particularly during the Renaissance, we see these figures now integrated in religious composition. So the Delphic uh, Sibyl, I don't have too much to introduce you. She's the one who uh, had prophesied the Trojan War. Uh, she actually, in this case, uh, would have predated the real Pythia, who was the um, priest, priestess of Apollo in Delphi. Just beautiful again, we have that energy in the faces. They are uh, very muscular for women. That's, we see that typically with Michelangelo who cannot show in any uh, weak person in a sense. The Eritrean Sibyl that was situated at Eritrea, a town in Aonia opposite to Chios. She also predicted the Trojan War, but um, also to some of the words seem to have uh, prophesied the arrival of the savior. And this was in a sense, <coughs> um, bringing in people prior to Christianity. So to give them a, a sense of being able to be saved, include them. The Cumean Sibyl, uh, near the Greek city of Naples. And it's uh, Virgil is supposed to have gone and consult her uh, before going uh, into the low world. So we go back now to Dante and the Divine Comedy. Older woman, but extremely muscular. I mean, any man would be jealous of that musculature. And the Persian Sibyl, we barely see her. She was uh, presiding over the Apollonian Oracle. And she is supposed to have foretold the exploits of Alexander the Great. And now the very famous Libyan Sibyl, um, surrounded still with the genies and the beautiful torsion of the body. This is again a later work where we see Michelangelo very exploding in, in confidence by now. She's holding the very heavy uh, book behind her. Here is, by the way, the drawing that she would also see that they always draw a naked body before they dress it up to make sure that the anatomy is correct. Though we know that he would normally not have seen a naked woman, this would have been forbidden. So very much, as you can see, his, the, the representation of women are actually the bodies of men with the face of a woman on top. Surrounding, as we've seen uh, before, surrounding all the, um, these frame um, 
images of the Genesis and at the foot of each of the prophets and Sibyls are these famous Ignudi. Uh, they're all different from one another, very much uh, classical profiles. They differ, every single one differs from um, the other. And they're surrounded, as you can see, with acorns and uh, oak leaves. Now, the uh, in in these in in these uh, triangle we find uh, some episodes uh, of the Judith and Oliphernes uh, sorry of the Old Testament, including this uh, Judith and Oliphernes, showing Judith and his and her servant and the decapitated body of the giant Oliphernes there. David and Goliath. So these are all episodes that have to do with uh, the Old Testament. The punishment of Haman. Um, this is part of the story of Esther, uh, where Esther had uh, was married to Asuerus, Asuerus, and um, Haman is uh, very jealous of her um, power. And so he's trying to, to discredit her. And finally she goes and tells her husband the truth. And Haman, as you can see in this case, you might not realize, but he's crucified. And this is an incredible image of that man crucified for his mistake for having tried to uh, discredit some people uh, and he's on that tree but with the, the hands coming towards you uh, crucified and dying extremely forceful image and then finally uh, Astart and Asherah in the brazen serpent the story where uh, as a punishment for having spoken badly uh, of the elders uh, people are facing snakes with mortal bites and are dying. And the only way at the request of Moses, uh, Moses goes and asks God how to prevent that. And God says, uh, put in the middle of a snake, a brazen snake that uh, they're going to, every time they look at it, they will be cured. Again, the incredible uh, mixture of people in different position, very forceful representation. Now in the lunettes, and I'm not going to show you too many, uh, but just to give you, this one is really interesting uh, because as you can see in Aminabab, these are all the ancestors of Christ. Uh, and he was uh, a prince of the Levites and he begets Nashon, who is on the other side, his daughter. Uh, as you can see on the clothing of Aminabab is that yellow circle, which was one of the signs that the Pope had, um, that the, the, the Vatican had forced the Jews to wear. Uh, this is part of what we call the sumptuary laws, is uh, how people, were forced to dress a certain way or not wear certain things that were reserved to the richer. In this case, he's wearing what is called the signum, a yellow badge of shame that was assigned to the Jews uh, in, uh, by the Lateran Council. And so uh, this was uh, for the Jews that had been expelled from, uh, from Spain and forced into a ghetto. Uh, another series you can see, so the window would be here at the bottom, Eleazar and Nathan. I'm going to go a little faster on these because they're less important. Jacob and Joseph, so all these are ancestors of Christ. So before I go into the restoration, I'm going to give you a very short break. I see one chat. Please un, uh, unmute yourself and ask me a question if you want. 
Yes, okay. Uh, I'm giving you a bibliography at the very end of this presentation. You will see uh, a few titles. There are a lot of books written um, on Michelangelo, as you can imagine, and on the different phases of his life and different uh, great moments of his career. And so I'll give you some more general one, except there is a, a small one that is dedicated to the ceiling. That's quite interesting. So you will have that at the end. And I'm also going to include it when I send you the PowerPoint. I will include it in the email. Uh, Any question? I just have one comment. On this uh, last uh, pictures where you they show the person in uh, yellow clothes, the fact is that uh, the, pope, the Pope had uh, an edict where the Jews in Rome had the yellow, they had to live in the ghetto. It was not a city. Sorry, but uh, there was some interference. Could you go, go no, on? What I'm, say, what I'm saying is that uh, this is not Angelo's interpretation, and he talks about the Jews having to wear the yellow gown. It no, was not, a, yeah, that's not a the real gown. life thing. No, uh, in, the, in the case, of, you remember, I talked about the fact that many in many paintings, uh, people that were really representing Israel were dressed in yellow, just like Joseph and uh, not the Virgin Mary, but Joseph typically was wearing a, a yellow garment. And that's an interpretation by scholars. In this case, the sumptuary laws were absolutely real. The Jews had to wear a particular yellow hat, conical hat when they were leaving yeah. the and they had to wear the signs on their clothes so that people could recognize them and there would be no um, crossing, literally, uh, risk of having um, people having intercourse or whatever with a Jew or uh, yeah. so that there would be no mixing with, with the, that, these hated people, literally. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And the yeah. qual the quality of painting in these last ones is not as good in my perception as the ones the other ones on the top of the ceiling. Uh, yes, and it could be that there some assistants um, did some of the works in the lunettes among them um, that Michelangelo, for example, the one I'm showing you here right now, that face is definitely painted by Michelangelo but probably that the other figures would be made by some of the assistants. There's such an incredible bulk of work. There's no way that he could have oh, done. Yeah. You see, and the then the other, the other question I like. have tried to say that he was doing everything by himself, even mixing up the pigments, which is absolutely unreal. Yeah. But then Vasari and Condivi, both of them pushed the envelope a little bit. Okay, the other question I had was the medallions in some of the frescoes, are they real? Are they cast medallions or are they painted? Trompe l'oeil. It's all painted. Okay. They painted bronze colors, as you can yeah. see. And there are more figures that I'm not even showing you because otherwise we're still there in a week. But there are <laughs> sculptures on both sides of around these um, lunettes. There are sculptures of uh, that are they look like bronze sculptures of nudes also to fill up. It, it's, there is not an empty place in that ceiling. You know, it's, everything is absolutely painted. Let me see, I have more chats. This is amazing. I think this is my favorite presentation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you know, when you present, somebody says, uh, you must be a Bible scholar too. You become kind of. <laughs> Because it's at that period, you know, everything has to do with the Bible. Everything, there's always a symbol of something. So that's, uh, you, you end up knowing, probably not as much as I wish, but uh, yeah, you end up knowing. So what are the thin cur curvy lines over some of the faces and bodies of the figures? Uh, they dry cracks. Yes. Uh, as everywhere, you know, particularly with um, plaster, the plaster is going to dry. And 
with the time, you do have little cracks and we'll see some details uh, when we show the restoration. Uh, the details are really show you, don't forget, you see that from quite a distance and the, all these materials, the plaster as well as is uh, under it, uh, do um, dilate or retract with the temperature or the humidity. And so you have constantly that play of, uh, you know, of, because of, of the weather conditions that are going to cause finally some of these cracks. And so in paintings, um, we have the same thing. That's why uh, copper painting, paintings on copper do well because the pigments and the, the copper dilate and retract at about the same rate. But it's not the same with wood and not the same with, with um, canvas. And here the same with, with um, uh, frescoes, we have, you know, nature playing its game. So yeah, yeah they, yes. It's a big subject, but the restoration of the Sistine Chapel over the years and the house quality has advanced. That might be something interesting in the future. No, we just, I'm coming to it. Oh, you are? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the future I, is now. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm going to go on now and I'm going to mute you again and hopefully I will run over the time, <clears throat> unfortunately. So I hope you can stay with us, uh, but uh, let me mute you again. And go on into the restoration. So what was the aim of the Sistine's restoration? They wanted to, they did uh, a couple of years before they started restoration, they did a lot of tests and, and studies. And so they progressively studied these to see any discoveries and use the appropriate technical response. They had to, they recorded every step of the operation in archival reports, reports and photographs and films. So they tested to make sure that the material they were using were not harmful and what is very important nowadays for any person who is supposed to restore a work of art, it has to be reversible. To repair the cracks and structural damage. So that was really one of the important steps in the restoration. To, because the, some places, because of the explosion prior and so on, that it really threatened the stability of the plaster that might just come out. Once the pigment is in the plaster, it's there. But if the plaster falls off, then we have a problem. So we also, they had to remove layers of grime that was consisting of candle wax and soot, which you can imagine, you know, there they were lots of services at night or with dark, the uh, weather or whatever. So you had these candles were burning almost all day long. So 500 years of candle wax and soot, you can imagine how much there was. But they also wanted to remove repainting by previous restorers because they had to try to uh, not clean it, but they tried to, to do things on top of it, which made additional layers and really, um, really uh, mask the beauty of the, the work and we'll see. They wanted to remove oil and animal fat used to contract salination of areas where the water had leaked. It is a roof, it's gonna leak. And wanted to remove crystalline accretion, accretion so, sorry, of salt that had whitened some area where water had leaked through. They want to conserve the surfaces that were in danger of further deterioration because of bubbling and flaking. And then, of course, they wanted to restore the places where you had uh, bad cracks and so on. And 
And so they also maintain in small areas a physical historical record of the previous restoration. So to make sure they, they knew where they were coming from. So let me show you, this is the ceiling before. This is the ceiling after. And this was an incredible revelation when it came out because a lot of scholars had based all their studies on the mysterious paintings of Michelangelo, the way they looked before. And so they suddenly comes out an incredible a brightness of colors and, and a range of colors that were incredible. And a lot of, not too many of them, but some of them denied and said they had removed the glazes that uh, Michelangelo has said that uh, he had never intended to work with such bright colors, but most people believe that this was the original color. So this is before, and you can see all the things we talked about and how uh, you have with, through the cracks, you have some humidity and so on that can cause that. And this is after restoration, it gives you an incredible feel for the difference. This is part of the creation of Adam, sorry. Uh, this is the snake and as I was mentioning, uh, to you uh, before is the beautiful iridescent colors that Michelangelo has applied on the snake and there you lose absolutely everything but this is and the green that comes out absolutely beautiful oh sorry and here is Daniel prior and later so you can see all the details that disappear where that face is almost not, you know, inexistent. But now we see that relief and that 3D that Michelangelo, this where you see the sculpture in him. Um, typically when a painter uh, paints this way, he's a sculptor too. Uh, an interesting point too uh, that I didn't mention is when everything was done, the Pope, because there was a jubilee uh, coming, the Pope, told the, uh, Michelangelo that was almost done to take down the scaffolding um, because there was going to be a big ceremony in the, in, the, in the chapel. And then when everything was down, he looked and he said, yeah, but you still have to add that gold there and that blue there. And Michelangelo said, but I can't put the scaffolding back up. And he says, oh yeah. And Michelangelo told him, you know, uh, the whatever name he gave the Pope, you know, uh, the, uh, they, these people were poor, they didn't need gold. And so it stayed there, the Pope was never able to get Michelangelo to rebuild the, the scaffolding to, uh, to do it. So the uh, chapel was inaugurated on the, in, 1513, in uh, 1513, and shortly after, um, Julius II died. He died in 1513. And so what happens is succeeded by uh, the Pope Leo X, who is the second son of Lorenzo de' Medici. And at first, uh, Leo is in good term with the De La Rovere until he tries to take, uh, to seize the Duchy of Urbino from them. And then they are not in good shape anymore. And so there goes again, the project for the tomb of Julius II that has, they decided to scale it down because we don't have the money anymore. The family of the De La Rovere really tried to get uh, Michelangelo to go on but without the agreement of the Pope, it was a very difficult thing to do. On top of that, they're working very much on the new uh, San Pietro, so the, the Saint Basilica St. Peter, no place to put it on. Michelangelo had started some of the work. Here is a new project, so scale down project, agreed on uh, by the, the family 
So the Pope has gone down now two stairs, if you want. You still have this, what they call the slaves, the prisoners around, and you still have uh, Moses and Paul there. And now we have the introduction of a virgin and child. And this was the original thing. So you can see how much more simple the second version is. Uh, but uh, this was by the hand of Michelangelo, the drawing. So what happens? Of course, he had started some sculptures uh, with the help of some assistant, but some by himself. And some of the statues in the new um, design for the, the um, tomb are not going to fit. And so not to distract you furthermore, I'm going to go on uh, with this, try to finish it though. It won't be finished until 1535. And some of the sculptures uh, you might be familiar with, like uh, the male nude and the rebelling slave that are now in the Museum of the Louvre were supposed to be part of the, that bottom part of the human humanity part of the, the large um, monument, Michelangelo was hoping to uh, integrate them into the second version, but finally, sorry, could you please mute yourself because I can hear, I can hear you talk. Uh, but then finally in 1542, uh, 44, sorry, he's going to give these figures to a Florentine friend of his, uh, Robert Strozzi, who was living in exile in, in Lyon, France. And so uh, he actually, that man gave it to the French King Francois the, uh, Francis I. And this is why they are in the Louvre nowadays. These are absolutely amazing images. Imagine that there were going to be eight of them uh, that were in all different positions. So this is uh, the interesting thing. This is the, the moment where uh, Michelangelo enters what you call the paragon, uh, the paragon, the idea of what is the most the, the most important art, is it sculpture or is it painting? And you have arguments on both sides that say, you know, painting can get some illusionistic settings that sculpture cannot. But on the other hand, sculpture can create figures in actual space. And so we never have a real answer depending from which side you stand. Um, but uh, this was one of the great discussion during the Renaissance all the way to the Baroque, where which was the real art? Was it uh, painting or sculpture, the most important of the two? So other figures were started. And I think it's really interesting to, to see these works. Michelangelo has actually finished completely very few pieces compared to all the numbers that he started. So here are four of the other slaves uh, that are now at the Galleria dell'Accademia in Florence. And uh, you can see the sculpture emerging from the stone. Uh, it's always interesting because I always wonder how they were able to do that. Now also understand that Michelangelo wouldn't do the whole work. Uh, he had assistant to bring in the, to break the stone about to the point where he could start sculpting. So all that work around here would have been done by assistant. Uh, but these uh, give you an amazing idea of uh, some of these other sculptures. Think over 40 sculpture in that one tomb. Some of the figures that we have, we have some sculptures we believe that they would have been part of the finished product if it had come to it. And this, that wonderful genius of victory, it would have been one of the two uh, figures of victories that would be set in the niches among the different um, uh, uh, slaves or, or prisoners. 
a very interesting figure here. We call it in a figura serpentinata because it looks like a corkscrew. And we see here how so much, uh, so how Michelangelo is so much ahead of his time and is going to be so influential on the mannerists that are going to follow in the mid of the 16th century. Also, you can look at the, the, the prisoner, the man that is kneeling on and the figure, and this has very much the, the uh, features of Michelangelo. Now, he doesn't seem concerned. He's a very serene figure. I'm talking about the young man on the top. Uh, he's, uh, he's actually very beautiful in his energy, but it's a very calm energy. And this has been also, as I say, quite a, a model for uh, sculptors that came later on. Unfortunately, by Michelangelo went on working, as you can see, this one was made between 32 and 34. Uh, was supposed to be part of the finished product. And finally, the family, when they were able to, came back and they came to a final uh, project that's similar to this, but not quite. That was the project in 1532. And the final pro uh, uh, proje product uh, is actually in San Pietro in Vincoli, it was never placed in the a new St. Peter Basilica. Um, and it is actually not the tomb of uh, Julius II because he's buried in the, um, the Basilica, but under just a uh, stone. So nothing particular to, to show him. And this is when you come into St. Pietro in Vincoli, you are faced. <laughs> with the amaz amazing image of Moses, who now thrones in the center, surrounded by two saints. And we have more saints at the top, and finally the reclined figure of Julius and uh, Madonna and child on top of him. The cornices also that uh, you see there are the same as the one that he designed in the ceiling of the Sistine. As you can see, this cornices is the very same model is what he's designing there. And he's going to use them in other architectural um, places too. And here's Julius um, the second. The two, sorry, again, why does he jump? Uh, Ra Rachel and Leah, Rachel and Leah, uh, the two uh, saints there that represent uh, the contemplative, contemplative life or Rachel and Leah means the active life. The whole original project was literally an image of the world uh, with all its different levels. And uh, it was really reduced to its minimum with uh, just the sixth uh, sculpture. Of course, the most important figure is Moses. Moses, who we have to keep in mind, was going to be high up. So we have included in uh, this representation some optical correction that Michelangelo uh, had done, knowing that the uh, sculpture was going to be seen from high up. And now it's at the eye level, so it's very different. It's actually... Uh, probably representing what we call the medieval conception of man as a microcosm with a flowing beard that represents water. The wildly twisting hair is fire and the heavy drape would be the earth. Now he has some horns, as you can see, which is a wrong translation uh, by Jerome when he uh, translated the, the Bible from Hebrew to Latin, mis, uh, mistranslated the rays of light that were coming from the head of Moses with the horns. These are pretty similar words in Hebrew 
and he took the wrong translation. This followed poor Moses for centuries before they corrected it for good. What is interesting is in the, the face of Moses, you can read that famous terribilita, that, that terrible character of both the Pope and of uh, Michelangelo. Though remember, Michelangelo was only an artist and the Pope was the Pope. So there was an optical correction. Shortly after, uh, the, the end of the uh, Sistine Chapel in 1521, uh, Michelangelo received a commission uh, for a statue of a risen, uh, risen Christ. And uh, he worked on that and it was really good until he reached close to the face and there was a defect in the marble, uh, the, the block of marble. And he was uh, absolutely terrified because he had a contract. And so very quickly in um, 1519, 20, he restarted with the help of an assistant, uh, the whole Christ. Actually the abandoned sculpture went to a friend of his because it was considered as a, a marvel. And unfortunately, the face was modified by one of the assistants and wasn't as successful as if it had been fully by the hand of Michelangelo. Michelangelo was in Florence, the statue went to Rome. Michelangelo heard terrible gossips that it was a disaster until a friend of his, who is going to be a great painter in the Mannerist time, Sebastiano del Piombo will reassure him in saying that it's a marvelous sculpture. Now the drapery was added later on. Uh, also both feet and both hands were pierced by another uh, artist. And apparently uh, what was really damaged was the nostril of the face of Christ. He also received some um, commission again from Florence to make a very large statues of Hercules and Cacus, um, or maybe Samson and the Philistines, they're not quite sure. That would have been the, the counterpart on the Piazza uh, della Signoria in Florence, counterpart to the David sculpture that he had done earlier. And this is one of these clay bozzettos, so this small project uh, in clay of the uh, what it would have been. He actually um, was interrupted uh, because of disagreement with the Gonfaloniere of Florence, uh, Pietro Soderini. Uh, he left the figure like this and then uh, was busy otherwise uh, when he came back and the work, the marble block that was dedicated to this was given to another artist who made uh, Hercules and Cacus, who is in the Piazza della Signoria and that you can see there. So this is one of the many works that Michelangelo uh, had to abandon. And we have to realize that most of the time these were not singular sculptures, they were a whole project. And so we have the disaster of the tomb of Julius II, which pursued him to his death. And then we have the incredible success of the Sistine Chapel, of course. He was then asked by the new Pope, um, Leo X, who was another Medici, <coughs> who wanted to uh, work on San Lorenzo. San Lorenzo was really a church. It didn't belong to the Medici as such, but it was really, it had become the church for the Medici. And so uh, the church had been built by Brunelleschi, uh, and uh, the, the interior decoration was all by Brunelleschi, he had done the old sacristy, and the Pope wanted a facade, because in Italy, this type of churches, you apply the facade on top of it. it does, it's not carved, as you see with the, the Gothic cathedral, uh, step by step, you apply it. And this is the project that Michelangelo had done for the uh, San Lorenzo facade, which, by the way, 
they are thinking in the recent years of uh, doing according to his plan, but it's still in discussion. They haven't come to a decision yet. This is Italy. So the Pope wanted the facade and he wanted a beautiful uh, room with the tomb for his uh, uncle and, uh, and some other cousins of the family. He is a view of uh, San Lorenzo, you see the facade here, and the monasterial, monastic uh, buildings with the cloister. You can see the old sacristy uh, hidden uh, over there. And then what's going to happen is going to make a new sacristy. And this is that huge building that you see there, as well as the uh, Laurentian library that we will see too, that is also a project to enhance the image of the Medici from uh, the Pope. So let's look at the old sacristy by, um, that was done by Brunelleschi in the early 15th century, uh, that was absolutely uh, built on the golden number with the perfect symmetry of the early Renaissance, uh, the orders, uh, this is uh, uh, ionic columns uh, decorated by uh, Donatello and uh, Della Robbia. So uh, an example of early Renaissance, absolutely perfect. So Michelangelo looks at that and wants to use some of these, and this is going to be the unfinished project of the Medici chapel, because again, uh, they're going to, because the Pope is going to die, they're going to run out of money and uh, only the two parts here are going to be done. But the biggest tomb that would have been uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent tomb will never be done. He's buried under a little plaque uh, behind the Virgin and the two saints that are there. Pietra Serena refers to that uh, beautiful, beautiful bluish gray stone in contrast with the white walls. So here is a larger view of uh, the chapel showing uh, the two tombs of, in fact, pretty obscure Medici there. There are some uh, later Medici that uh, are not going, uh, not very known, but the two figures that were really important, like Lorenzo and Giuliano, are no, not going to receive the uh, tomb that the uh, the Pope anticipated. So let's look at these because they're quite interesting. So this is the tomb of Giuliano de Medici, but then a much more recent Giuliano than. Um, the brother of Lorenzo. He, is, uh, he was a general, nothing very famous, but they uh, show him not as a portrait. He is there as an idealized figure with a body of armor and a rather pensive uh, representation. What attracted the interest of uh, most scholars are the figures uh, that are uh, on top of the, the tomb of the night and the day. Again, these sculptures, except for the night, the others are unfinished. Uh, Michelangelo was never able to finish them. Very interesting though is the night because uh, we understand the symbolism of uh, the night. She has her uh, foot on a, a bowl of uh, poppies. You have an owl that is under her leg. Um, you have that very uh, heroic musculature that doesn't belong to a woman. She has her hand bringing a veil that would show for the night. And then there is that mysterious mask there that actually has uh, Michelangelo's features. Uh, and not everybody agrees on, on the, the meaning of uh, that uh, mask. That could be just the fact that it's hiding for the night. On the other side, you have the figure of the dead, which obviously uh, is not finished. The face is not uh, finished. As far as the, the sex of these people, the, the 
uh, night correspond to la notte, so it's a feminine, so that's why you have a woman representing night, and il giorno, masculine for day, and so you have a man there. As I mentioned often, Michelangelo doesn't really make women women, they're often kind of body of a young muscular man, uh, on which he kind of put some breast that seems very unnatural. But very beautiful work, again, very uh, anticipating very much the Mannerist period is going to come. Now, this would have been surrounded by other sculpture. They would have been sculptures at the bottom uh, that would represent the, the river gods and uh, all other different um, sculptures. So this is an unfinished project. And here's the detail of Giuliano de Medici, as you can see, a very uh, idealized classical figure. On the other side, you have twilight and dawn, same thing. The sex of the sculpture uh, goes by the name of, uh, so Il Crepusculo and Laura, uh, so ma male and female. Uh, this one, the sculpture itself is finished, but it would have had uh, many symbols that would have been added and they were not, and this one is not finished either, uh, with Lorenzo de' Medici, another cousin. The, the architecture that is around is really going to become uh, the perfect representation uh, of uh, Michelangelo's architecture. Now, that last wall, uh, the main sculpture of the, the Madonna, the Medici Madonna, uh, was sculpted by Michelangelo and is absolutely beautiful. Has some reminiscence of the Pieta a little bit, but the typical gesture of the child that is again uh, moving around, kind of torsing the, the body to grab her is so typical of his. The two other sculptures were made by his assistant Montorsoli and Montelupo. But there is no emotion, there is no contact. It, it's a, a rather a cold representation. Now, as I mentioned, that this would have been finished with other sculpture. This is one of the river gods that uh, would have been part of it. This is unbaked clay, the, so a project life-size project uh, of, uh, for the, the final sculpture, but it was never completed. Okay, sorry again. And this other sculpture of the crouching boy would also have been part of that uh, display beautifully um, representing that the, the whole ensemble would have been an allegory of the inex inexorable march of time, uh, but was never uh, completed. Now, connected to, to this with, is the, the beautiful uh, Bibliotheca Medicea uh, Lorenziana, so uh, library where the, the very large uh, collection of books that belong to the Medici would have been displayed and put at the disp disposal of all the scholars flowing to, <coughs> to Florence. That was designed by Michelangelo too, though was it was made when he was gone because he went back to Rome. Uh, again, he feared for his life. There was a lot of jealousy around. So around uh, 1530, uh, he decided to leave and uh, go back to Venice before going back to Rome. And so the design was done, it was made, it was uh, built by another uh, architect. So it is the, uh, another Medici who is going to commission uh, Michelangelo to design this. And it's absolutely beautiful. The, the floors were very pretty though. These are made later, but in a sense mirrored the coffered ceiling on the top. And all that Pietra Serena again is inspired by Brunelleschi, but becomes a typical um, 
motif from the, the uh, Michelangelo's architecture. The very interesting place is that that, uh, lib that library was uh, high up. It was built on top of the monks' um, cells. And so they had to reinforce the walls of the building below to be able to take that weight. But from the, the um, uh, from the floor of the um, sacristy, you had to take some steps to go up. And there Michelangelo devised a staircase, though he had made a rapid sketch and that was not very descriptive. It's years later that the, the young architect went to Michelangelo and said, you know, I need more explanation. And so he said he claimed that he had seen it in his dream and he gave him a little more particulars to be able to build that uh, staircase that is spectacular. Though originally he would have wanted a double staircase that would go up, it wasn't done. Uh, other, and I'm gonna go rather fast because we're so much behind. Another sculpture uh, that he did uh, was actually uh, commissioned by the papal governor of Florence, Baccio Valori. And uh, uh, this, people are not sure, is he a David or is it the Apollo? Uh, he has his foot, it's uh, an, again unfinished, so he has his foot on that ball that could be the head of Goliath that would have been sculpted later. Uh, but also very interesting in his beautiful position and the arm that comes across. Uh, the face. Uh, Paul III, he is going to be another important figure in the life of Michelangelo. He knew him because he had spent time at the court of Lorenzo the Magnificent, became cardinal in 1493, and is uh, going to uh, become Pope as Paul III. Uh, in 34, he's a Farnese originally. He is going to be in charge of the reconstruction after the sack of 27 and uh, in charge of the restoration of the authority of the church, supports uh, the new religious order such as the Jesuit and he's going to open the Council of Trent. Very quickly, Florence and the Cosimo, the last expulsion of the Medici will be between 27 and 30. And then in 30, he's, they reinstated with the help of Clement VII and the political support of Charles V. And by that time, they're going to become not anymore just the head of the council, but they become nobles, which is going to disgust um, Michelangelo, who didn't like that. He liked the Republic. In 37, Cosimo becomes Duke of Florence. He's made Grand Duck. Duke, Grand Duke, Grand Duke of Tuscany in 69. And in 34, Michelangelo decides to leave um, Florence for good and he will spend the rest of his lime, life in Rome. The later 16th century sees religious reform, as we know, large national states ruled by strong leaders, urbanization, growth of middle class, shift in economy from small states to large countries, from regional to uniform style promoted by the church. Whereas you had a lot of style that were very typical for each cities like Urbino, one side Mantua was another uh, Venice. Now it becomes a much more uniform style that is promoted by the church and the rulers. Expansion of the prince, the fact that the prince take quite an importance is going to also give a chance to other painters to see what is done in the north or in other parts of Italy. And then we start founding the academies. And now we see Rome becoming the artistic center of Italy and Europe, not anymore Milan or Florence. So moving to the um, to the Sistine Chapel again. The 
And the, the finishing of the Sistine Chapel had already been discussed with Clement the Seventh, uh, Medici. Uh, he uh, wanted to replace, there was a, a fresco at the end of the Sistine Chapel by Perugino, but there had been a lot of damage because of a fire. And so they had to replace that fresco. And so they, they had already approached Michelangelo about that. Michelangelo was by that time, uh, he was in his early 60s and he didn't feel very much like doing such a huge work, but you don't say no to the Pope as you can imagine. And so the uh, major commission came from Paul III, his successor, uh, that uh, decided with theologians on the whole program. He actually forced Michelangelo to do a very rapid execution of the work uh, and they, of course, had to uh, destroy the fresco uh, by Perugino. The reason why they wanted such a program was you had in 1533 the defection of Henry VIII, and then we had with Luther the warning about looking for salvation outside the church. And uh, this was a big threat. It's again, for us, seems to be petty, but it was really important in the whole symbolism of the church. What we see in this program is incredible. This is really the mannerist side of Michelangelo with overdeveloped muscles, dramatic position of bodies, uh, and so very much inspired from Hellenistic sculptures. So what we see is that normally in the uh, Last Judgment, Christ would be on a throne and looking rather uh, sternly to uh, other people. In this case, he's much more uh, dynamic. He's uh, almost standing, his arms are moving and you have that whole crowd around him uh, that is very much in movement and interacting with one another all the way uh, going down to see people coming out of the, the earth and that are either going up to uh, join Christ in the heavens or going down to uh, hell. Interesting uh, influence, of course, of some of the uh, statues that are in Rome at that time, the Hercules resting, you can see compare very similar to that figure here in the, on the left. And then the Hercules on the right is also, uh, can be found in Christ and other uh, figures. If you compare this with the Giotto Last Judgment, I mean, it's, it's in absolutely incredible how in uh, two centuries, a little over two centuries, we have such a difference in style. So, the energy is in, in the head a little bit, but the rest is pretty static. He is definitely influenced by Signorelli in that kind of energy of the figures, the interest in anatomy uh, that we have seen already by Signorelli in Orvieto. And it's the theater of the world. So let's look at quickly, unfortunately, to this. And we have on both sides on the top, the different instruments of the passion that are uh, carried by angels. Uh, the column, as you can see here, uh, the cross on the other side, the crown of thorns, uh, the nails. You see some of the angels holding the nails of the passion, the spear of Longinus, with which he pierced the, the side of Jesus, the sponge and the veil of Veronica. Uh, yes, I must, there. no, okay. So let's look at some of the figure. We have St. Peter there. We have Simon of Cyrene that we can recognize who is helping Christ carrying the cross. Lawrence, that is being uh, whose uh, martyrdom was on the gridiron. Uh, Catherine, St. Catherine with a broken wheel. St. Blaise uh, here, who is another 
uh, important saint at that time. His, uh, his uh, symbol is a carding comb. And interesting too is the way uh, the, the, the scale of the figures that are there, that are not uh, done with a proper uh, perspective, but more in depending on their importance. Now, among these figures are really little uh, places. We, we have the figure of Michelangelo here that is uh, inserted in the middle, but also some images, for example, there are two men kissing and two men embracing that are very often, by the way, removed from reproduction because people are still rather bigots that don't want to see these realities of life. The figure of Bartolome, of Bartolomeu uh, is interesting, not so much by the saint who was, by the way, flayed alive but by the skin that he has, that also has the features of Michelangelo on the face. Or that other face of the man that seems to be pulled down by, uh, by a, a devil there and is the image of anxiety and uh, and fear the torment, which was the terror of Michelangelo. So it could be in a sense, a um, psychological portrait of Michelangelo. And if we look at the bottom, it's really quite interesting. Uh, we have the, the scene of Charon, Charon, and he literally portrays what Dante says about Charon. Charon, the demon with eyes of glowing coal, becoming them collecting, collects them all, smites with his or whoever lingers. And so this is a direct reproduction of what that this says in the Divine Comedy. Also interesting is the figure of Minos. Uh, and he's given to Minos literally the portrait of Biagio da Cesena, who was a counselor to the Pope and who uh, resented dearly the fact they were nudes in the Sistine Chapel and wanted to uh, give them more modesty. And he will succeed once Michelangelo dies in 1564, uh, Daniele de Volterra uh, is going to be in charge to mask all the nudity that is on the, that fresco and literally putting drapes or fig leaves. This has been restored and removed since during the Great Restoration. But it's interesting because his nickname, and he was a good painter of his own, uh, in, his nickname was Il Bhagetone, so which means the, the, um, the brief, if you are the person of the brief, the, the pants to, to hide um, the nudity of these figures. Michelangelo, and I'm going to go very quickly, also is credited for some architectural things. He's the one who uh, redid the Piazza Campodoglio, so the, the Capitol, Capitoline Hill. Uh, he's, uh, he redid it uh, and uh, enhanced, did actually the design for the floor, which was put in not too long ago. <laughs> But they really uh, started showing his particular style. I'm going to go, this is the floor. I'm going to go quickly because it's getting late. He is the Sena uh, Palazzo Senatorio also, where he's the one who designed that uh, dual staircase and the Palazzo Nuovo with these that are very typical of uh, Michelangelo's arch architecture with these high piers that go, this called the the Ordo Nuovo. He did also part of the Palazzo dei Conversatori. It's conservatory, it's all these buildings have been modified since. So we can see the, the hand of Michelangelo, but there's been a lot of modification since. And the Palazzo Farnese also where he took over uh, what his friend Sangalo the Elder did before. 
And then uh, one of his last sculpture uh, is that bust of Brutus. Uh, a lot of speculation also on who the features are. Uh, this was uh, a bust that was for the Cardinal Niccolo Ridolfi, who had fled Florence for Rome, uh, as many Florentine did in 1530. <coughs> and it's supposed to be the, the features actually of Lorenzino Medici, who had killed his uncle, uh, the Duke Alexandro. Now, uh, quickly two questions on Michelangelo. He, his sexuality, uh, it, we're pretty sure that he was homosexual, but he was very strongly Catholic. And it's believed that he, in a sense, uh, would never go into homosexual acts, but he felt them very much. And we know that he was in love many times with men and he was an incredible poet. He made a whole volume of poetry. Uh, and this is one of them that really express that love that he had. Uh, and this was to uh, the, one of the last men uh, that were in his surroundings and who stayed with him until he died, uh, Tommaso de Calavieri, Cavalieri. I feel as lit by fire a cold countenance that burns for me, me from afar and keeps itself ice chill. A strength I feel two shapely arms to fill, which without motion moves every balance. Uh, it's interesting that not too long after he died, uh, they found all these poems and somebody in the translation changed the, the the sex of the person he was talking to, making it a woman. And it's only lately that they brought it back to where it was originally. He was though in love with a woman. He was tremendously in love with Victoria Colonna, a great poetess herself, a great figure that he met in 1540, unfortunately died in 1540, 1547. And I'm not gonna read that poem that he wrote about her, but she had a lot of influence on him, on his religion too. She was on the progressive side, if you want, closer to reformation, not, though not Protestant, but she agreed on some of the errors of the church and pushed uh, Michelangelo very much to that um, direction. He said that he wished he had kissed her face as much as he, he had kissed her hands. Uh, so they had a very uh, profound relationship for seven years. And it's with that mind that he probably did these, the beautiful, these are the last two pietas, I'm going to show the other one in a minute. Uh, very different. Uh, th that pieta uh, probably planned to decorate his tomb. He wanted to be buried in Santa Maria Maggiore. In, in Rome uh, at the feet of that one. But unfortunately, uh, again, as it can happen with marble, it came at the time with a defect in the marble. And so uh, one of the legs uh, of the sculpture had uh, broken off. And in 1555, he broke it to pieces. And it's only a servant of his who with his agreement, put them back together and was able to reconstitute the, 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 what you see, a very unusual representation of uh, Nicodemus who is holding Christ and only Mary and Mary Magdalene supporting the body. So giving that uh, impression of, uh, as they, a lot of people say, the idea of a promise of redemption because the features of Nicodemus are the ones of Michelangelo. And so this was close to being heretic to think that you could have salvation independently from the church. Extremely powerful image. And then the last Pieta that he had started also in 1555 when he broke the other one that he worked on until four days before his death uh, remained unfinished. Uh, also, he actually dug so deep into the stone that he was unable to 
uh, he had no, not enough marble to finish it. It had become too thin. So here's the face. And there we have, as they say, they don't know who carries who. Is it Christ carrying Mary or Mary carrying Christ? Quickly, he was asked in 1546 to become, to design uh, the uh, St. Peter's Basilica that had gone through a succession of architects, starting with Bramante in 1506, followed by Raphael, and then Sangalo the Younger. Uh, and then finally in 46, Michelangelo, it had been started. They had problems with the big piers that were there that were not solid enough. And then he designed it. The only change that will happen later on, and we'll go through that once I talk next year about it. Uh, it was then the nave was lengthened by three bays by Moderno because they wanted a bigger church, but otherwise, it was patterned on the martyrium, a central plan church. He's also going to be the one who finds the solution for the dome. Nobody could make it. It was so huge. And he came, this is one of his designs for the dome. And this is the solution he found that is similar to the making of uh, Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence with a double dome, the inner dome and the, uh, and the outer dome. Uh, alleviating the weight that would be on the inner dome uh, that way. And here you can see Santa Maria del Fiore, you can see St. Peter, and then of course all both of them go back to the idea of the Pantheon. But the difference with the Pantheon is that the dome rests on a continuous wall, where these I think I have an image that, yeah, you see the, the double dome here and there, not here, this is solid, but covered. But the domes, where the, as you can see, the continuous wall in the, in the Pantheon is actually uh, very different to the one in Santa Maria, uh, in the St. Peter, where it rests on four piers. So you have to have this pendentive that bring up the weight of the dome on these very large piers that make uh, the interior of uh, the, the choir. And this is the way it looks outside. I had to really shorten this. It has the lantern that Michelangelo had uh, designed and the ribs that are uh, helping to hold the, um, uh, the, um, the, the dome on the drum. So sorry for this, uh, maybe one day I will remake it and we'll do it in better condition. Michelangelo died on the 18th of February, 1564. Uh, he had suffered three days prior a stroke and they found him walking around uh, his uh, workshop outside. He didn't know where he was and he wanted to go back in. They brought it him and for three days, he wasn't very clear. He had been suffering from uh, nephrolithiasis, which is a kidney stones uh, for a long time. And that had really been an impediment for him. Uh, he also suffered from gouty arthritis and uh, that had also uh, been for a sculptor, it's really uh, very bad. So when uh, his uh, uh, cavalier, he was there and others, uh, when he died, he had asked to burn most of the papers that he had around him that could have been compromising, uh, religiously speaking. And um, then there was a big dispute on his body. Uh, his nephew, Ludovic, Ludovico, uh, <coughs> claimed that the body had to go back to Florence, that that was his which some people believe he wanted to be buried in Rome. But anyway, his body was smuggled out of Rome and arrived in triumph in uh, Florence where they built this um, tomb for him in the Basilica of Santa Croce. And this is where he's buried. So an incredible character, very tormented character, but I was really looking at his life and oh my gosh, if we think we have difficult 
we live some difficult times right now. I would not have liked to live when he was. So here's a short bibliography. There are other books, but here, the one I've used is the top one, Anthony used, because it's a very clear, well laid out, well, um, here is the book. It's not a huge book, but it has very good illustration. I love Phaidon in general, they're really good. Uh, the book on the Pope ceiling by King Ross is rather uh, actual and pretty clear, gives, gives good anecdotes. And then you have a book on the poetry of Michelangelo and another uh, rather recent book on the artist, the man and his time. So at this time, I'm going to, I know some of you have stayed on. <laughs>